dictionary definition of music is the art of arranging sounds in time through the elements of melody, harmony, rhythm, and timbre. Low Pass Filter is a show about the nature of this thing we call music, how it functions in people's lives, how it's contextualized by society, and why we find certain music meaningful. This is Low Pass Filter. Filter. Hello and welcome to Low Pass Filter. My name is Matteo Noche and I'm here as always with Bandon Wayne. Hey Bandon. Good morning. Thanks, Cheers. Thanks for being here. Uh, we're outside uh, of the Axis Humboldt Studios uh, doing it al fresco. Yeah. Uh, you know, That's something nice. new. Oh, cool. We're not going to sleep in these chairs. fresh air this time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So as, uh, as always, we go back and forth uh, every month um, picking topics. And uh, this month, it was my turn to pick a topic, and uh, the topic I picked is, who owns music? I mean, who really owns? Who it? really owns yeah. it? And is it ownable? Um, apparently, so it is. Apparently, apparently, it is at least in a legal sense, yes. but it, in a moral sense, yeah. Is does that uh, equate with uh, legal and, as often happens, uh, legal and moral do not uh, intersect. Uh, all of the time. Yeah, sometimes uh, the legal side tries to push the moral side, perhaps. That's right. Um, to me, it's uh, it gets pretty philosophical talking about this kind of thing. Um, yeah. You know, the rights to control music uh, as an art form, and once it's released into the world, is it still controllable? Do you still maintain ownership uh, once it's out there? Yeah, and, and for me, I think there's also a question of what is actually original music. Yeah. Uh, there are only seven notes in the Western scale of, uh, yeah. uh, of music. You throw in some half notes in there as well. Uh, but uh, that's not a lot of uh, territory to play with. Um, so you're going to have some repeats. Yeah. There's about, uh, I'm told, my sources tell me that there's about a, a little over 4,000 unique chords. Um, and so that sounds like a lot, but really, if you're talking about millions and millions and millions of songs, yeah. uh, you're going to have chord progressions that repeat themselves. Indeed. And does it, what does that mean for ownership? Does that mean that you've copied somebody? Yeah. Uh, it seems as though the core of what we're getting at this week is that the, the limitation of uh, the notes and chords in terms of, uh, you know, creating completely original work and being distinct from someone else's work. Um, and I think perhaps we're also dealing with sometimes two songs may sound like one is completely ripping off the other song or so inspired by it that it can't help sounding like it. And then the other side would be complete coincidence. Totally yeah. unintentional, um, you know, not plagiarism, but unintentionally copying something. Right. Well, there's a lot of well-worn grooves in, in, in the songwriting uh, sphere. And one of those is called uh, the most popular progression in music, which I'm going to throw some musical terms at you. I don't know. Maybe there'll be some graphics involved. We'll see <laughs> if they're necessary or not. But the one five... 6-4 uh, progression, which often is seen as a C major, G major, A minor, F chord progression, is used in thousands mm -hmm. and thousands of songs. Indeed. Uh, in all kinds of music, from punk to Western music. And if you boil it down to even simpler, you could take out the six chord and you could just say the the one, the five, the four, the one, the four, the five, those are used in, you know, there wouldn't be country music really without that chord progression. Okay. Um, yeah, a lot of times we talk about three chord rock and roll riffs. Yeah. Um, you play guitar and piano, you have a bit more theory and, and melody. 
being a, a drummer, I, I never learned as much about that, but I, I have some intuition about melody. Um, but yeah, so you kind of think of, uh, you know, say Chuck Berry as kind of a bassist, um, and then, you know, he kind of played those chord progressions in, in various configurations, but uh, anybody influenced by that is bound to be replicating those chord progressions. Right. And I'm not saying that, you know, that even the songs that use these, these per chord progressions are not, com not original. Uh, I mean, obviously, though, there are lyrical things that are happening, vocal things, and performance things yeah. that happen in these songs that makes them subtly different from each other. Yeah. But really, at a bass, they're using the same seven notes, the same four chords, uh, over and over and over again. Um, trying to create something new out of that, yeah. But um, that, how does that connect up to being an original song that you can own? Because you know, let's take the blues for example. Um, you know, uh, blues players—they uh, really came out of a tradition in the South. So uh, it wasn't yeah. so much that they were writing new songs, but they there were traditional songs that they would appropriate. So. You know, your average blues player would, would go to a house party, he'd hear another blues player singing one of his blues songs, and then he would take that, that song, add his own lyrics, and voila, it's yeah. the same, he's got a new, new song. Uh, but really, you know, if you think about the blues, there are really like three major forms of the blues. There's the 12 bar blues, there's a couple of other ones that get recycled over and over again. Yeah. You add, you know, lyrics, different lyrics to it, uh, and different feelings and performances that make them different. Yeah. But really, at the base, you're just playing the same old blues riffs that, yeah. that you know, came about, you know, starting in Storyville, you know, uh, back in the turn of the century and moving through the 20s and the 30s and up into the 50s when they became electrified. Yeah. So in that sense, uh, a repeated chord progression uh, could be the basis or canvas for adding your own lyrical story. And so it didn't really matter if the same... Uh, the same basic chord progression was being reused. It was it was uh, a vehicle to to tell your particular story. Sure. Um, but I think once some uh, white British rock and rollers got a, got a hold of that stuff and and started playing with it, then it, it started to become maybe an issue of stealing. Right. Um, well, because it, you know, uh, just to do a little bit of history on on uh, blues music, it was basically relegated to race music. They called them race yeah. records. Yeah. And uh, that meant that they weren't sold. Uh, you couldn't go to Woolworths and buy them. You know, you had to, you know, bought them. They were in the back room of, of a country store somewhere. Um, and so, you know, when these white musicians like Elvis, for example, uh, started, you know, mining these, these records, you know, yeah. uh, that's when the money started to happen. Yeah. And a lot of this thing about ownership and who owns songs and whether they're ownable circles around, I think, to the money. <laughs> as, as, as so many things do. <laughs> yes, indeed, man. Once money's involved. Yeah. Um, yeah, so what was once just a um, folk tradition becomes a business. That's right. And that's when you start getting into these issues. And, uh, yeah, then, then how do you... How do you deal with that? Where do you go from there philosophically? Um, you know, and, and once uh, the era of rock and roll, once the business of selling records came into play, um, then you want to be your own unique artist because that distinguishes you and helps you sell to a particular audience. Um, and so then you get, well, this, this artist sounds an awful lot like this artist. And is that, is that cool? Is that not cool? Yeah, is it conscious or is it unconscious? Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, because we all, you know, live in a world where, you know, music is everywhere. And, uh, you know, you might have fallen asleep to uh, the Rolling Stones and then w uh, woke up in the next, the next morning with this great song called Satisfaction that you, <laughs> that yeah. you wrote down, you know. 
and uh, not without you know without realizing that uh, you know that had already been done. Yeah. Um, <coughs> so you know we were talking about the intersection of money and uh, attorneys and all that kind of stuff, and and so this is where you get things like the uh, the Spirit uh, copyright suit against uh, Led Zeppelin and yeah. Stairway to Heaven. And just a little bit of background, in 2014, uh, Randy Wolf, who was, I think, the guitar player for the band Spirit. Randy um, California. Randy, also known as Randy California. Uh, although I don't know why he changed it from Wolf. That's a pretty, that's a pretty <laughs> cool name. I, yeah, I, mean, I don't know why you, have, why you have to do that. More letters, it'd be harder to sign <laughs> autographs. I don't know. Anyway, he claimed that um, a Stairway to Heaven infringed uh, a, a copyright of a Spirit song called Taurus. Yeah. And uh, that got drugged uh, through the courts. I think it initially was found in his favor um, and then yeah. uh, was appealed and retried. And I think there was two or three trials uh, for this particular... Yeah, it seems to me that was a very long-running yeah. case about this particular song and, and Spirit's belief that, that Led Zeppelin stole that from them. Uh, I've listened to it a couple times and... and didn't seem uh, that obvious to me. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think the story goes that the two bands played live together before Zeppelin wrote the tune. Okay. And and so it was believed that Jimmy Page heard that and felt like he could use a little bit of it. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, the 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 suit was ultimately re resolved in 2020, uh, and it was found that uh, they had not indeed copied. Randy California's uh, song, or Randy Wolf or Spirit song. Yeah. Um, so that reinstated a, a, a verdict that I guess originally went Zeppelin's way, then went against them, and now it, it went back to. And I think it's gone up to the Court of Appeals, the Ninth, Ninth Circuit. Wow. So I think without going to the Supreme Court, uh, that's that's going to be the end of that whole thing. And of course, Ran uh, Randy passed away. So I think in, in the course of that. And I think actually his his estate took over uh, that suit, but um, so the thing uh, that uh, Led Zeppelin Led Zeppelin argued, and that I'm kind of arguing here, is that they use the same chord progression that's been used for 300 years in in Western music, yeah. and is included in songs like Chim Chimery, you know, from Mary Poppins. Um, so uh, you know, again, it comes circles back to this there's nothing new under the sun sort of thing. Yeah, and I think another thing uh, with that case being a good example is would the group Spirit have necessarily been more successful had Led Zeppelin not written that song? Would uh, Led Zeppelin ultimately still have been a more successful band? I think so. Yeah, they had a body of work that, that uh, you know just became more popular. Um, probably a greater body of work than Spirit. Um, so, you know, if it comes down to money, uh, is is the group Spirit just upset that they didn't earn as much money as Led Zeppelin? Well, obviously, you know, uh, getting circling back to the money again. There's that's a huge payday because of the popularity of the song uh, Stairway to Heaven. Yeah. Uh, just go into any uh, guitar shop and listen to somebody uh, you know, testing out a guitar and, and you'll see the, yeah. you know, the, the, the influence of that. Yeah, that song uh, did have a huge impact on music moving forward. Um, uh, another thing is, is um, it's not the first time Jimmy Page or Led Zeppelin have been accused of taking from other That's artists. Right particularly the original blues artists that they were influenced by, uh, without giving any credit whatsoever. Um, yep. You know, the actual obvious, deliberate pieces of, of original blues tunes that were incorporated into some of Zeppelin's early, early works. But again, it, it's an argument that will probably continue on for a long time, whether or not they appropriated something uh, in, in you know, a dishonest way, or... Or did they appropriate from the appropriators? <laughs> because if you think about it, the blues artists that in question in those songs also appropriated their their material from other blues artists. So, 
yeah. uh, you get into the racial thing of these white artists came in and appropriated, in quotation right. marks, blues music from black artists, but of course the black artists were doing exactly the same thing. Yeah, uh, was, was Howlin' Wolf playing his completely own original stuff that Zeppelin then took from, yeah. Yeah, I would argue that no. I mean, w was Howlin' Wolf unique? Was he awesome? Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, but we'll talk a little bit about, as we go along, about what um, constitutes original works and how they are acquired by the people that acquire these works. Um, um, and by people, I mean corporate people, uh, not, not actual people yeah. that are walking around on two legs. <laughs> Um, so another famous uh, suit, um, and you'll, I guess this would be a good point to mention that if you want to check out these songs and see if you think they're similar, uh, as a lot of people do, we both have our playlists, Spotify playlists that are listed uh, below yeah. in the, uh, in the, the doodly-doo below us. Yeah, we tried to pick out some good examples of songs that, that uh, exemplify this, this idea we're talking about. Yeah, so you can check it out and see if you, if you, think, you think they sound alike too. So the other one, the other big suit was the George Harrison, My Sweet Lord uh, suit from um, All Things Must Pass, My Sweet Lord, which was a huge hit for George coming out of the Beatles, his first solo record. Yeah. Uh, he was then sued um, by Ronnie Mack, uh, who wrote the song He's So Fine, which was a hit for the Chiffons in 1963. Mm. And in this case, uh, it didn't work out so good for the, uh, for the quiet one. Um, he actually was found to have plagiarized uh, that song, uh, either consciously or unconsciously. Uh, Unfortunately, I'm not familiar with this case. Yeah. Um, I know the song by the Chiffons, honestly not as familiar with, with the George Harrison, although that is a great record. And I yes. I do love selections from it. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, you would think George Harrison would know better than than to directly plagiarize another song, um, although all four of the Beatles, or at least the, the principal songwriters in the Beatles, were clearly influenced by so much else. Right. Um, and, and the majority of their early recordings are other people's songs. Yeah. Um, you know, but George Harrison is is clearly a unique musical artist. Um, yes. Uh, so. Well, he, you know, he claimed that he used, he, that he did in fact plagiarize a song, uh, that he uh, used an out of copyright uh, Christian hymn called Oh Happy Day as his inspiration for that melody. Okay. So uh, he, he claims that, well, yes, I did, I did quote unquote, air quotes, plagiarize a song, but it was something that he, you know, that was in public domain, that he had, had a perfect right to uh, Reuse, re yeah. recycle. Yeah. Um, uh, and so, therefore, the chiffon song could possibly be based on that. Exactly. Yeah. And I think, I think that's where he was going with that. Yeah. Didn't work out for him. That's too bad. <laughs> in that case, it really does seem like it comes down to uh, litigating for the sake of of getting that payday. Yeah. You know. Yeah, and uh, you know there there are what I like to call copyright trolls, that really will go and and just start looking through music and and uh, look yeah. for things that are similar, and then uh, convince somebody to sign up for a, a lawsuit. Yeah, and and then uh, sue on that basis. There's a whole uh, there's a whole lawyer world. Uh, yes, there is. Drumming up lawsuits. Right. <laughs> They say everyone hates an attorney until you need one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kind of like when they would, uh, you know, uh, chase traffic accidents. That's right. Like that, you know, uh, except they don't have to get up out of their chair for this one. <laughs> they sit yeah. in front of their computers. Poor George, that's too bad. Uh, yeah. Well, you can't feel too awfully sorry for him. I guess he was in, you know, one of the biggest. Uh, for sure. Groups. <laughs> Uh, one of the one of the fun things about uh, doing a show outside is now it's raining. Yeah. How how <laughs> <laughs> how heavily is it going to rain on us? I, I guess we'll see. Oh man. Um, I can I can handle a, a certain amount. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
Well, this might be a natural spot for us to take a break and duck under cover for a minute or two and yeah, see if it's going to clear up. <laughs> we'll be right back with some more low pass filter in, oh, just, in just a minute. stop raining yeah yeah i was just saying as we were standing off camera and in, in, under the uh undercover that murphy's law you do a shoot outside and it starts to rain but they, even if there's only a little cloud in the sky it comes over it comes on. somebody somebody coined the term for a reason that's right they well the the so we've been talking about lawyers we've been talking about uh money and music and so the question arises who actually owns music and are they good stewards in their ownership of the music? Um, most of the music that you listen to every day is owned by three corporations three corporations sony music group sony music and warner music group and these three companies make 1.7 million dollars an hour off of music revenues. Just all day, every day. All day, every day, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Wow. So, yeah, that's uh, that's per, well, see, actually, I've got two things here. One says that they make two million every single hour. Oh, that was in 2019. So, I, I, I guess in probably in the three years, they're probably even making more. Because if you, you know, think of all, you know, the, you know, the Spotify, uh, situation, other outlets for music you know, that have kind of popped up in the last few years. Um, just more opportunities for the money to come rolling in. Yeah. And, uh, you know, combined with the fact that they're making the money and the artists involved are probably not making it at the same rate as they are. Uh, Generally, when an artist signs a recording contract, uh, well, let's just say something about copyright law, and that is that there are two kinds of copyrights. There are the songwriter's copyright, and then there's a performance rights in yeah. those songs. Yeah. Um, and so they each earn uh, uh, royalties. Yeah, so I think that's uh, copyright of the work and then uh, publishing rights for the songwriters. That's right. And uh, yeah, so. In the sense of a band, the whole band will earn money for the recorded work, but one or two of the people, maybe the principal songwriters, they'll have their own separate royalties right. for that, which often causes issues within a band as well. Yeah, and a lot of times these uh, people are young and hungry when they sign their first recording uh, contract, and uh, you know they often don't either don't have an attorney or they have an attorney that poorly understands the dynamics of signing a contract. You know, things like who owns, ends up owning the masters for how long. Um, they often don't understand that uh, even things like recording uh, uh, costs, okay. uh, uh, things associated with making the record are deducted right off the top okay. before they make a single dime yeah. uh, um, yeah. of, that, of that money back. <clears throat> and. Uh, you know, so uh, let's just say these work out favorably in, in, in the case of most corporations as opposed to the artists themselves. Yeah. Yeah, it's probably become a little bit easier in uh, the modern digital world to uh, create your own path. 
uh, having some monetary success um, without the need of uh, basically investors to help you get, get your recording made and get promoted and stuff like that. However, uh, there's a lot more people in that ocean and uh, the audience that you have is kind of divided up much more than they have been if you were promoted by a big record label. Um, so, you know, it's a different world, different ways to go about it. Um, so there's kind of pros and cons to that. But in some ways, perhaps, you may have uh, less debt to, to your backers. Well, I, I would, I would <clears throat> posit that, uh, you know, it's not good when three corporations own most of the popular music. Yeah. Uh, and when they have a lot of money, if they have a lot of money, they're making a lot of money, and then they can use that money to hold on tighter to the, the music itself. Yeah. Uh, I the other um, the other day I, I did an Instagram post of my I have an old uh, record player. You, know, you kids, you can ask you know, your elders what those are. Uh, <laughs> it's the hand crank one. Right? Uh, well, not quite that old, but but pretty old. Uh, but anyway, I just was just showing that we had we were out on our deck and we had set it up and we were listening to music out in the afternoon. Um, you know, from a distance you could hear what was playing on the record, and I got a copyright strike on Instagram. They took my post. Oh, out. of course, yeah, yeah. almost yeah. immediately. Wow. Uh, so not even a little snippet of, uh, and I think we're talking, the music in question was, I think it was, might have been like a Jackie Cleason record. <laughs> it was like, yeah, it was not like, wow. it wasn't Beyonce, you know, wow. but, uh, but so yeah, so even your personal use and ownership of, of the yeah. music, yeah. Um, I mean, you sell physical media. And so, a lot of ways, that's the only way you really own music anymore. Uh, because if you have digital copies, if you have a Spotify, if you have a iTunes library, you know that's all subject to you know that long, yeah. long thing that they make you yeah. click on before you can okay. use their their uh, devices. Yeah, I think you bring up a, a good point that is another example tying into the concept that, that you brought up this this month. Uh, because on physical albums there is usually a statement expressing that you do not have, even though you've paid to buy the record, you do not have the right to publicly disseminate the sounds from that record. You're not allowed to do what they would call a public performance with it. Um, and working in the record store uh, years back I learned that we are the record store itself is one of the only places that is exempt from copyright infringement by playing records in your uh, retail space. So if you're another type of retail store, a clothing store, uh, this comes into to question a lot uh, with bars, right. venues, um, you have to pay the man. Right. The, ASCAP, uh, are you out there? Yeah, you have to pay them in order to play that. If you're a clothing store or a restaurant, it's considered an enhancement of your ambiance. Mm -hmm. And that's not free. You right. can't just choose to play whatever you want. Um, it's considered public performance, and you have to pay ahead of time to, to have the license to do that. A record store is exempt because we're promoting the music sales. You're selling their stuff. Um, I would not be surprised, though, if, if, uh, you know, if they wanted to. They can find a way to come after you. Uh, uh, Don't give many ideas. No. <laughs> but another thing that kind of ties into that, um, and I remember in the mid '90s, mid to late '90s, um, Garth Brooks, who was at the time one of the biggest selling artists of all time, he may still be one of the biggest selling artists. Uh, he did not like record stores reselling used copies. He claimed that. So he should get paid again. Yeah, he should get paid again for having those resold. And, you know, that is kind of a weird, nebulous situation there. That, uh, you're, you're selling a commodity. You're selling something. It's not necessarily uh, the 
new license to manufacture and copy. Uh, so it becomes a second hand thing. So the record store that sells new and used is kind of in a dual business, but it's all. It's well, all then you kind of have the other side of that coin where someone like Taylor Swift, uh, you know, had her music uh, transferred from one corporation to another. She was not happy about that. Um, she, oh. I think she, she tried. I think she tried to get her masters back. I don't think she realized at the time that she didn't have control of those. Right. Uh, and this is what the impetus of her going out and re-recording uh, oh, records. Okay. Uh, re so she got it right the second. Her time. only choice was to re-record them. Right. Interesting. In order to get back the ownership of yeah. that, or at least some of the ownership of that. So, uh, but uh, I would. One of my things about corporate ownership is that they're not particularly good stewards of the music that they have. And the thing I, I like to point to is the 2008 uh, um, Universal Studios uh, fire on the back lot, which destroyed, uh, because all of this music had been uh, gathered up by Universal Music, consolidated, uh, it was brought all brought to one location, or most of it was brought to one location. And uh, the predictable thing happens, just like raining uh, on a uh, TV production, is a, is a worker with a blowtorch uh, heated something up and then went off and left for the day. And uh, the vault burned down. Uh, they confidential in a confidential memo, uh, UMG has uh, asserted that uh, half a million song titles went up in smoke, including some of the most iconic music in the world uh i just go down the list of a few of them because it's really jaw-dropping to to look at what uh, what was lost but louis armstrong duke ellington judy garland patsy klein all of chuck berry's masters were lost um, even things that multi-track masters of songs that were never had not been yet recorded chess records virtually the entire uh, catalog of chess records was went up in smoke. Helen Wolf, Willie Dixon, Bo Diddley, Etta James, John Lee Hooker, and most of John Coltrane's Impulse Masters were also lost. Yeah. And things like Rock Around the Clock, the Masters for that, uh, uh, Rocket '88, the uh, uh, Impressions People Get Ready, all went up in smoke because the the music was. Because Universal Music Group, frankly, was not a good steward of the music. Sure, yes, they were great at making money off of the music, but they were pretty terrible at making sure that it was there for the rest of us to listen to. And the loss is incalculable. We're talking about stuff that we'll never hear, that was unreleased, that yeah. now we'll never hear, we'll never know anything about it. And so this is kind of to my point of what happens with consolidation of a lot of things, uh, airlines, what have you, but especially in, in the music uh, realm, can have really tragic consequences. Yeah, that is really tragic. Uh, it does perhaps um, legitimize uh, digital transcriptions of, of uh, you know, I prefer analog copies. Um, yeah. Um, because I do think there could be issues with digital as well. Oh yeah, um, you could have servers wiped out. Uh, you know, the, the, the quality can be degraded in some ways um, from the analog. But um, you know, you can save things you know, in a virtual way and avoid a natural disaster like that. Except for a solar flare, maybe. <laughs> right, but. Um, yeah, it sounds kind of like what you're talking about with that, you know, sort of a mismanagement, perhaps. You know, the, the money is more important than actually caring for this work, and you know, perhaps not enough uh, care and focus was put on where do we store these? And they will be completely safe. It's almost like I own all this stuff, and I'm just going to shove it in the closet here. Right. Uh, it's the old uh, all your eggs in one basket yeah, uh, yeah. scenario. Well, um, it's come about time for us to take another break. We're going to go away for a minute. We'll come back with some more La Paz Filter.
back to Low Pass Filter. We're talking about who owns music, uh, if it's ownable. Well, we know that it is. We know that legally it is, but morally, it's not a question entirely. So let's dive into our list and yeah. talk about that stuff that uh, it's is said time. to sound a lot uh, alike. Yeah. So what, what, what do you have? Well, uh, I started off uh, if I'm going down my list, I started off with a song and a legal situation that I just find hilarious um, because it involves the same artist being considered to have plagiarized their own work. I love it. Which is John Fogarty being sued by Fantasy Records. Um, the original song uh, by Creed's Clearwater Revival was Run Through the Jungle, right? And Fantasy claimed that his solo song, uh, Old Man Down the Road, was a plagiarism, <laughs> and I mean, you know, uh, also because John Fogarty is always going to be John Fogarty, and he has he has a pretty consistent songwriting style. Yes, um, not that it gets boring and repetitious, but uh, you just can't take the Fogarty out of Fogarty. Right. So, <laughs> uh, and there, for we should stuff. mention too that there's no love lost between Fantasy Records and John Fogarty. Okay, well that's good. <laughs> Yeah, they've they've uh, had a litigious history, and uh, I think he tried to get his uh, CCR stuff back, uh, claiming that he had sole ownership of it. Uh, didn't work out for him. So there's, there's <laughs> yeah, yeah, a silly, silly situation. Um, and then I had uh, Bittersweet Symphony by The Verve, which was indirectly using a piece of Rolling Stones material from. Uh, uh, was it the last time? This will be the last time. Right. Um, but the Verve sampled from uh, an orchestral piece of music uh, doing the Rolling Stones tune. So there again, uh, who owns that? <laughs> right. Apparently the Rolling Stones did because they uh, sued the pants off of the Verve and took all of the uh, future earnings that that song would have. Um, any, any money generated from the performance of that song, whether in a commercial or a movie or on the radio, would go to the Rolling Stones. But That's I not guess, nice. That no, was not no. no they, I, I think the Rolling Stones were a little harsh on that, but maybe maybe they were just letting their lawyers go to town. Again, the lawyers, the money, yeah. the people that own the copyrights are probably uh, absolutely... I always had this impression that, that uh, Mick Jagger would somehow be that kind of guy, though, because he did go to law school, yeah, I believe, when he was young. And, and uh, I'm sure the Stones, or he went to business London school. London School of Economics. Yeah, he went to yeah. business school, not law school. Uh, but, uh, yeah. So yeah, he is a really great businessman. Yeah, there is so, no question about that. So you figure uh, he's going to, to uh, you know, make the most money he possibly can. Uh, but I don't know if he's that... That mean of a person. Um, anyway, <laughs> we should make we love you. <laughs> recently, apparently, that was uh, sort of overturned or renegotiated, and, and now the firm will get to make some royalties off of that piece of music. Good for them. Because it really, I think, it exemplifies uh, the idea of borrowing, recontextualizing, and creating a whole new piece of music out of it. If they did use someone else's work. But they made something new. It yes. wasn't just copying that song and, and not crediting that they took it from someone else. They didn't change it to, this will be the first time. <laughs> it, it, was the last, that was uh, <laughs> it was the last time for the verb that, uh, for that. Well, here's another one of these court cases that, that, that's been fairly recent, and that is the Blurred Lines Got to Give It yeah. Up court case. Uh, Blurred Lines, of course, by a guy named Robin Thicke. Uh, and uh, and uh, got to give it up, uh, Marvin Gaye. Yeah. Um, I think uh, Robin got his pants suit off, uh, so now he's walking around in shorts. Uh, I'm a little more boy biased uh, towards Marvin Gaye in, in that situation. I, I really didn't follow the Robin Thicke thing. I wasn't listening to his music. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. His dad was on a sitcom, that's all I know. The other one I had, and this one is fairly obvious, uh, I think, but there was never any lawsuits over it, but uh, Sweet Little Sixteen by Chuck Berry and Surfing USA. 
I mean, very, yeah. they, they sound very much alike. And again, just remind you that we've got these songs in our, in our Spotify playlist. You can, yeah. you can check them out. Yeah, definitely check them out. That one's a little tough for me because I, obviously Chuck Berry preceded the Beach Boys. And there wouldn't be a Beach Boys without those early rock and rollers. But the Beach Boys were so in the tradition of that. And, you know, I think at that time, uh, it was it, the nucleus of what they were all doing was, was so much um, more current. You know, they were all coming from the same place. <laughs> yeah, and I think, I mean, the scope of rock and roll at yeah. the time was narrower. That's what I'm getting at. Yeah. Is, what can you do with these? Yeah, you know, or Captain Beefheart hadn't come along yet, so you know, nobody had blown the place wide open. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, the idea that, hey, it's a three chord rock and roll song, and, you know, everybody's, do all the kids are doing it. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. of course, they idolized Chuck Berry. They, you know, they yeah. they, they were one of his heroes. You could see where and you know, that would happen. Brian Wilson clearly went on to be a very uniquely artistic oh, songwriter. Yeah. Um, and as you said, all the kids are doing it. Like, think of how many songs different artists were doing that were based on dances at the time. Yeah. You know? um, so, yeah, uh, it seems a little over the top to, to go after them for that. But. Yeah, I don't think there was any case. They never, I mean, again, a lot of that, this all happened before, uh, you know, music and legal things really got onto steroids, really, which kind of sort of happened in the 80s, is really when. Uh, you know, post uh, home taping is killing music. Uh, you know, uh, happened. Um, so in the early '60s, mid to early '60s, when that all happened, there really wasn't the the appetite, legal appetite, to do that. Yeah. Uh, to sue on that basis. So that that one kind of got grandfathered in, I guess. If you will. Yeah, and they were all selling records to the teenagers like crazy, so they were all pretty happy. Yeah. You know, pretty content with the money that was rolling in. What else do you have? Uh, here's one uh, I, I need to even listen to more. That this just recently came to my attention as I uh, was going to see Joe Satriani live mm -hmm. uh, with a friend. And, and uh, apparently, he sued Coldplay over this song called Viva La Vida by Coldplay. Vaguely, vaguely familiar. Yeah, I, I, I love Satriani, I'm familiar with a lot of his work, but um, I would not have known that he believed Coldplay stole his melody. And it also seems kind of odd that Coldplay would even know Joe refer Satriani. to Joe Satriani for <laughs> <Yes>. his <laughs> influence. I mean, I'm just barely aware of these sort of guitar heroes sort of guy. Is he not? Is that, he, is that very much yeah. Yeah, in the vein of Steve Vai. Right. Uh, Post yeah. Eddie Van Halen and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, just would his stuff be on their radar? And subconsciously, they assimilated some melody he created into the one of their songs. I, I don't know, but I think he won. Oh, okay. So, all right. You know, well, he had the better attorneys, maybe. <laughs> I suppose so. Um, let's drop this one because this this one. Uh, you know, I, I can't imagine that Kurt Cobain would have thought he could get away with stealing somebody's melody or would even have felt good about doing that. And he was pretty aware of, of his influences. Um, so the song Come As You Are, people thought sounded so close to 80s by Killing Joke, which is Killing Joke's most uh, commercially successful song. Um, the chord progression is very similar. Name, verse, riff, and come as you are is very similar to the Killing Joke song, but I would think that Kurt would be aware enough. Yeah, or would he, or would he even think about it? Would it even that would it even occur to him? Really? Maybe yeah. Not, yeah, I don't know. I mean, <clears throat> it did have kind of a similar flangey filter on the guitar, <laughs> um, but I would think that he liked Killing Joke probably. Yeah up to them, uh, but I, I don't think he would have consciously. Con yeah. Well, again, that comes back to this whole unconscious thing. We're all influenced by things. Everything we hear, uh, I've, you know, 
I'm a songwriter myself, not a very high renowned, uh, shall we say. I've probably written 50 or 60 songs in my in my life. I don't feel like I have ever, ever had an original thought <laughs> in my entire life. That's an interesting uh, uh, perspective to have. <laughs> well, I mean, it's not like I set out to steal anything from anybody, but I'll, I, you know, uh, there are songwriters and songs and feelings and things that I admire and then so um, you know I would consciously incorporate those yeah. kind of feelings and, and uh, you know is that stealing you know uh, I mean it's the milieu the the sea that I swam in as I grew up listening to music yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean how can that not come out in something that Anyone writes, uh, you know. Every, you know, the the songwriters of the fifties, you know, or, or owe something to the songwriters of the thirties, yeah. you know. Uh, so, you know, this is this is kind of what I'm getting to. My my uh, premise uh, or my thesis for this particular show is that, you know, how can how can anything be original unless you dropped it from Mars? <laughs> I think you you picked up a Casio keyboard <laughs> and start whipping out songs, right? I yeah. mean, you, yeah. you 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 know everything that you do in this world really is a result of what is built upon yeah. what happened in the past. Yeah, there are, I would say, a a minority of popular musical artists who somehow seem to be coming from their own sort of otherworldly space, like how did they arrive at this sound? The influences would be hard to to narrow down. Um, does that make them more interesting, more lovable than an artist who clearly wears their influences on their sleeve, or if you really analyze their music you can start to pull out, you know, uh, you know just like a, a painter who is original, they've got techniques from other painters. Yes. Um, and obviously, like we were talking well, about, well, they're like using a brush, you yeah. know. <laughs> oh, you use a brush. <laughs> right. Why don't you? Like, I was the first person to use a brush. <laughs> You're stealing from me. Yeah, I mean, uh, and, and so like we talked about at the top of the hour, um, those chords, those chord progressions are, are they're floating around out there, and. and, and it would be hard to come up with completely original chord progressions. The guitar only has so many strings and frets. The piano only has so many keys. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, a reed and, and your breath and aperture only has so much capability of doing certain things with it. Um, so that's kind of the, the core premise of what we're getting at. Yeah. Um, obviously, there's the legal side of it, but but. Uh, well, I guess I guess just to, to put a finer final point on it is like if nothing really or, or the pool of things that are absolutely original is actually pretty small yeah if you listen yeah. to popular music of the last 50 years really everything owes something to everything else yeah. Yeah. Uh, so in that case uh, and if you can successfully sue people for that like George Harrison you know then why isn't everyone going after everyone else because really yeah. Uh, you know, everything owes something to everything else. And I think another point to add to that, I might be jumping around here, but um, but when two things are very similar, and there could be the debate as to one stole from the other, then you also have the element of what the audience chooses. You know, your song sounds like somebody else's song, but the audience likes your song better. Right. Uh, you know, that... To, in, to my mind, that's democracy right there. You know, uh, <clears throat> right, but that's also the point where it becomes important, important to the attorneys. Yeah, <laughs> because if no one's listening to your song, yeah. it sounds yeah. like she's so fine. He's so, you know, that, that they're probably <laughs> not going to come after you. But yeah. once you start making money off of that, yeah. Another thing I was going to add to what you were talking about um, in the '80s when the artist Anya hit this this moment of, of sort of mainstream popularity um, or 15 minutes yeah I remember hearing an interview with her I was much younger I was in my early to mid teens uh, but she said something in the interview that, that kind of 
kind of blew my mind a little bit. I didn't know how credible it really was, but she said that she does not listen to anyone else's music whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Now, I assume that that meant she isolates herself from other music so that she can be truly original, so that her ideas, her thoughts can be truly original. She obviously lived a life up to that point. I'm sure she absorbed lots of music. She obviously didn't go into any supermarkets or ride any elevators. <laughs> Come on now. Uh, yeah, yeah, completely. She took the stairs always. Uh, <laughs> uh, but she somehow tapped into the market there. Right. So, yeah. Well, we just got a couple minutes here left. Let's, uh, let's just, I'll just run through the last uh, two that I have, and we, we both have, well, this is one we both have, which is All Day and All the Night yeah. by the Kinks, yeah. and Hello, I Love You by the Doors. Uh, Ray Davies, uh, in his uh, inimitable fashion, uh, claimed that uh, Rodney Krieger uh, ripped him off uh, totally. And there, I mean, there are similarities uh, to the song. And then well, another one that I had was 25 or 6 to 4 by Chicago and a song uh, by Green Day called Brain Stew. Yeah, that one was completely off my radar. I, I really dig that Chicago song. Yeah, don't know great the, song. Don't know the Green Day song. And that seems like a, a weird... It's remarkably simple. Weird. Well, I guess I guess I can see Green Day digging on the Chicago. Yeah. I guess that's not too far out there. Uh, I don't really want to end on this note, but the one other one I had on my list that I just think is kind of uh, funny kind of absurd um, is I Want a New Drug and Ghostbusters. Okay. Uh, Ray Parker Jr. Uh, really felt that Huey Lewis was stealing from him. He wrote, I Want a New Drug. All right. Well, you can, you can listen and decide for yourselves. Yeah. So much, and you know, as we've said in this show before, so much of music is subjective. You know, what you feel, what you hear, what you take away from it uh, might be different than what somebody else does. There was a quote by uh, one or both of the members of the group Negative Land mm -hmm. who have notoriously been involved in legal suits over plagiarism, but they purposefully were trying to, to shine a light on what they thought was, was an absurd sort of legal mindset in regard to that um, and I don't know if this applies to everything we're talking about today but um, <laughs> we're gonna get a copyright strike on that <sighs> Sorry. okay uh, the, the quote was uh, if you don't want anyone to uh, do anything with your art keep it in your living room yeah Words to live by. <laughs> well, that's going to just about do it for this uh, installment of Low Pass Filter. Um, be sure and like and subscribe. Uh, tell a friend uh, about yeah, the show. Please do. And, uh, ben, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. We're, we're, we're dry now. Yeah. It's not raining. Yeah. The sun came out, and uh, soon the birds will be singing. And as long as those birds don't copy anybody, they'll be in good shape. Yeah. So we'll see you next time on Low Pass Filter. Thanks for watching Low Pass Filter. at lowpassfilter2020 at gmail.com. Be sure to like and subscribe and hit the notification bell to be notified about future shows.